Section 22 of The Golden Web by E. Phillips Oppenheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Chapter One, Free to Die. About a quarter past ten in the morning, a man, still young, but deathly pale, with hollow cheeks and receding eyes, stood on the edge of the pavement outside a great and gloomy-looking building. A nail-studded door had just been opened and closed to let him pass. The attendant, who wore prison livery, leaned forward curiously to look at him as he walked out with uncertain footsteps. The prison doctor stood by his side and called a four-wheel cab. "'You are sure,' he said, "'that you have somewhere to go, Rowan?' "'Quite sure, sir,' the man answered. "'Keep your courage up, my man,' added the doctor. "'If your friends can afford it, "'go down to the south at once. "'You will find it easier there. "'There's your cab. "'You have some money, have you not?' "'Plenty, thank you, doctor,' Rowan answered. "'You've been kind to me, sir,' he added. "'Thank you.' There wasn't much I could do, the doctor answered, helping him into the cab, except to get you out of this hole. Make the most of your time now. Good luck to you. The cab rolled off, Rowan, after the first few minutes' exhaustion, due to his unaccustomed preparations, leaned forward on the seat, looking out with hungry, wistful eyes upon the world which he had scarcely hoped to see again. Very soon the full flood of London traffic was flowing past him, the streams of men and women jostling one another upon the pavements, the long, tangled thread of moving vehicles, taxi-meter cabs, hansoms, and wagons. The sun was shining. The faces of the people seemed to him accustomed to the white, hopeless countenance of the men he had passed in his daily exercises and in the prison infirmary, usually buoyant and cheerful. It was a glad world, this, into which he had come, a world which he was soon to leave. It was hard to think he was free, only that he might crawl away into some corner where he could die. The cab stopped at last before a block of offices in a by-street of the city. Rowan reluctantly alighted, and crossing the pavement, entered the building. He passed through a swing door to a desk. A small boy poked his head out of an inquiry office. "'Can you tell me if Miss Rowan is employed here?' Rowan asked. "'Yes, but you can't see her,' the small boy answered. "'She's in with the governor now.' Rowan hesitated. "'Perhaps you will kindly tell her, when she is disengaged,' he said, "'that her brother is here and would like to speak to her for a moment.' The office boy withdrew his head, but he seemed uncertain. Rowan seated himself upon a hard bench set against the wall. On a small round table in front of him were pens and paper and a copy of the trade journal. Rowan turned over its pages listlessly for a moment or two, and then set himself down to wait. It was quite half an hour before a door in front of him opened, and Winifred Rowan appeared. She looked at her brother in blank astonishment. She was paler than ever, there were dark rings under her dilated eyes. She looked at him as one looks upon some strange monstrosity. Basil, she murmured, it can't be you. And yet, Basil? It is I, he answered. Free, she cried. He laughed a little bitterly. They have let me out to die, he answered. The doctor today signed a certificate that I have no reasonable chance of living longer than another month. So here I am, free. Winifred, if you like to call it freedom. She came and sat on the bench by his side. At that moment, it was hard to say, from their appearance, which of the two seemed the nearer death. When were you released? she asked. Half an hour ago, he answered. I came straight here. I wondered whether you could get a month's vacation and come with me somewhere south. We have enough money for a little time. If they will not let me go, she answered, I will leave. That is simple enough. We have enough money, Basil. We will go this afternoon. He shook his head. First, he said, I must see, I must see. Whom, she asked. A friend, he answered. Someone who may be inclined to do something for me. Not for myself, he added hastily. That, of course, is ridiculous. But it is of you I am thinking. Of you after I am gone. I shall be all right, Basil, she said. We have several hundred pounds left, you know. 
it is not enough he answered firmly winifred will you go on an errand for me where to she asked with a sudden sinking of her heart to a man whose address i will give you a rich man a great man i think that he will be willing to do something for us his name is sterling dean i will write his address down for you mr dean she repeated i have been before to see him basil i went before your reprieve came of course he said i had forgotten well i want you to go up to him now i want to see him but i do not want to go to his offices where do you live winifred it is an apartment house for women only she answered i cannot take you there then we must go to a hotel he said it seems a mockery to buy clothes but there are one or two things i must have tomorrow we will go somewhere south she glanced at the clock i will see whether i can get away now she said she disappeared and came out again in a few minutes with her hat on come she said he led her to the cab outside we will drive to a hotel he said when we have taken some rooms you shall go and see mr dean i think that he will come to me if you will tell him that i am free that i have only three weeks to live and that i should like to see him very well she answered they stepped into the cab tell him to drive to one of the large hotels rowan said any except the universal she shuddered as she gave the order she too had her memories of the universal of which he knew nothing slowly they made their way westwards the girl held his hand in hers it is good to see you again basil she said it is good to be here again he answered to be out in the world even though it be to die i suppose the authorities have really been kind to me it is as much as any one could expect and yet winifred i should like you to remember this always the quarrel between sinclair and myself was of his seeking not mine the blow of which he died was struck purely in self-defense i could box and he couldn't or he would have half killed me that night i know she answered breathlessly don't talk of it he went on as though not hearing her he came at me with both hands clenched and i hit him under the chin i had to or he would have killed me if he could he was a strong man and he had been drinking until he was half mad it was not my fault winifred oh i know that she said try and forget it now it was a wicked wicked accident life has been wicked enough for you and me lately he answered sighing you are worn to a shadow winifred i suppose it is this wretched typing day by day we must put an end to it she shook her head i must earn a living dear she said but don't bother about me i shall be all right see he has stopped this must be yes it is the grand hotel will that do he nodded quite well he answered he paid the cabman and making some excuse at the office about luggage to come took rooms then he put winifred into a hansom and wrote down for her dean's address which she already knew bring him back with you if you can he begged bring him back here i shall be waiting in the reading room just round the corner there to the right she hesitated you look so faint basil she said i am not sure whether i ought to leave you i am going to have some brandy and milk he answered i am going to sit down and have it there in that corner i shall wait till you come you will know where to look for me hurry dear please i shall know no peace until i have seen dean End of section 22